Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Happy Wednesday. Uh, we have a, a very special guest today, and that is the uh, enormous elephant seal. Uh, the, the, the male seals can be more than 10 feet long, weigh more than three tons. Um, here is, there are some uh, king, <coughs> king penguins here for scale. And uh, the way that these uh, elephant seals organize on the beach is there'll be one of these bull uh, males kind of surrounded by a, a harem of uh, female seals and uh, pups. Uh, and they have a sort of melty appearance, as many seals do uh, when, when on land. And uh, they are kind of all crowded together, uh, perhaps because the uh, male seals are, are, as we saw with fur seals, very protective of their spot on the beach. It's going to be theirs. No other, no other male seals uh, should be allowed there. And so they'll, they'll make themselves known with kind of loud bellows. But should, uh, should someone encroach on their territory, they'll, they'll rear up to their 10-foot uh, height and uh, try and uh, uh, shove the, the other seal away. The, the brown penguins in the foreground there are, are juvenile king penguins. And not only will they, they uh, make themselves look big, but they'll start slamming into each other in this, in this battle for their spot on the beach. Um, and they'll kind of rear up and then slam into each other. And this can be a quite uh, brutal affair. Uh, there's um, uh, plenty, of, plenty of scars to show for these, these beach battles. Uh, but the, the males are not the only ones who get, get into to arguments. Uh, female elephant seals do as, as well. Although it remains the case that the babies are extremely cute. Um, even, even when they are they're maybe practicing their own uh, uh, beach battling technique for, for the future. All right, what questions do you have about uh, the Critter Lab, uh, dictionaries, anything we've been, we've been working on? Yeah. yeah. All right, I just noticed that we have been visited by purple whiteboard pumpkin. I think this means we'll, we will now have a, a good class, so that's, that's good news. Um, all right, so there is a new lab out today, our last uh, required lab uh, of the course. It will be an optional individual lab after this, but this is our last required lab, uh, last uh, pair programming lab. And uh, this one has a, has a historical uh, theme to it, so the Enigma machine was an encryption device uh, used by the Germans in World War II to uh, encrypt their messages so that their enemies couldn't, couldn't read them when they transmitted them uh, via radio. Uh, and there's um, one of the earliest uses of computers was by uh, British and allied uh, uh, code breakers trying to break this Enigma machine code and, and other um, enemy, enemy encryptions. And so for this lab, you will be implementing a simulation of this Enigma machine. And the machine looks something like this, where uh, the operator would press these sort of typewriter keys. So if they press the letter T, that would light up one of these lamps showing what the kind of encrypted version of that letter should be in whatever message they were sending. And inside this machine were various kind of, uh, basically an electrical system that determined when I press the T key, which letter should that show up. And in lab six, you've been dealing with uh, classes, implementing these different critter classes, and this was on this concept of an interface. That is, all of our critters have exactly the same methods because they're all going to be called in the same way. Uh, and we can, for each of the different classes, implement a specific version of the method to give our critters different behavior. But at least in the code you were writing, it wasn't the case that we were writing classes that had to call each other's methods. 
And that's uh, from a kind of uh, practical Python side what this Lab 7 is all about, is we have a collection of classes and now these classes are going to be kind of more interconnected than, than our critters. So specifically, we're going to have uh, an Enigma machine class that is going to uh, create um, objects for the keys, <coughs> for the lamps, and for the rotors. When a key is clicked on, and the write-up describes how to uh, I'll hook this up where the key is going to be this mouse down method on it and it's going to call back uh, it's going to have a, a parameter that is the this Enigma machine class and it's going to call uh, the key pressed or key released uh, methods on that object to kind of cause the appropriate thing to happen when a key is clicked on. So this is kind of one of the connections between, uh, between our classes. And these key pressed and key released will uh, call, will call methods in lamps and rotors, because when we press a key on the machine, it needs to uh, both turn on the lamp, like show which letter is, uh, is output. So that would be like turn turn on <coughs> Or turn off for the lamp, and when another aspect of our Enigma machine, which uh, in the uh, testing advice, there's a link to this demo program, which is uh, the lab you are implementing, implemented on, on a web page, and for each milestone, uh, it is... Uh, Kind of showing kind of what changes about the uh, about the view, um, and when we get all the way to the complete program, whenever you press a key, a lamp lights up for the letter, and this and these rotors, which are controlling how the encryption works, change. So how letters are encrypted change each time you press a key, and that's. And so our rotors are going to potentially advance every time a key is pressed. So the write-up goes into much more detail. I just wanted to have, uh, hopefully have you, as you start this lab, kind of keep in mind that this is about, we have different classes that are going to be calling each other's methods, kind of make all the parts of this machine work together. Any questions on that? All right. So I said last time that uh, when I explained what was going on beneath the surface of dictionaries, it would become clear why we couldn't have uh, two of the same key in the dictionary, and then I just completely forgot to explain what is going on underneath the surface. So, I, let, it, let us assume that we have some function, I'm going to call it magic, and that when we call this function on a key, it spits out a number, and that this number will be uh, 
different for every key. So we have some magic function that can take a key, give us a number, and we know, we can just assume that number is going to be different for every key. Once we can turn keys into numbers, something interesting becomes possible. We have a structure already that uh, can store a collection of objects, and that's our, our Python list. That's what we, that was our way of storing collections of things before we ever talked about, about dictionaries. And something we know about lists is that they, each spot in them is given a number as a name, an index. So we have spot zero, one, two, three, four. And if we have a function that can turn a key into a number, we then want to, if we had some way to turn the number into an index, then we would be able to go from a key to an index in our list. And then we would know, given a key, exactly where in our list to find our key value pair, uh, the, the key that goes with that in that spot and the associated value. Because when we thought about using a list to represent uh, our kind of key value pairs before, our problem was we had to, we were going to have to search all the spots in the list anytime we wanted to look up a key. And so assuming the existence of our magic function, that can give us a number. And can anyone think of an arithmetic operator that we have, which given a number, let's say we want uh, our index, our, our list here has n different spots. Can anyone think of an arithmetic operator that given a number, we can apply to get a result that's between uh, 0 and n minus 1. So, uh -huh. Range. Range will, will give us a, a sequence between 0 and 1. I want to turn a number into a single other number that is like between zero and, and n minus one. The trick here is if I say remainder n or modulo n, any number I put here, modulo n, is gonna end up between zero and n minus one. Like that is what the remainder operator means. It's kind of what's left over when we divide it by n. Well, what's left over has to be between 0 and n minus 1. And so with this magic function and with modulo the length of our list, we can go from a key to the index where that key belongs. And so anytime we want to look something up or insert something in the dictionary, we're given, it's, we're given the key, we can turn that key into an index, and then we find or put the key value pair at that index. So, for example, I, I was going to have a, a volunteer uh, named Bilbo in my example. So maybe magic of Bilbo returns uh, 10,138. Just turn it just gives just gonna give us some number that's different for every for every key. Then I take 10,138 
remainder five, because I have five spots in my in the list that I'm actually using to, to make the dictionary work. What is 10,138 mod 5? Yeah, we have 35 would be the multiple of 5, and we'd have 3 left over. And so then <laughs> in index 3 is where I would put the key value pair. The key was Bilbo. The value was bb at bagend.co.uk. And so I didn't have to, to search through all the spots. If I go to look up in the dictionary what value is associated with the key Bilbo, I can just repeat this process. And it will give me the same index, and I'll know to look there. And that can tell me, oh, is there, is the key Bilbo there? That can tell me if that key is in the dictionary or not. And it can tell me uh, uh, what the value associated with that key is. So aside from what this magic function is, which I will talk about next, what are your questions on, on this so far? Cool. Can you say a little more about you said we have this list to make our dictionary work. Uh, why do we need a list to make a dictionary work? Uh, so we need to store the information in the dictionary somehow. Um, and uh, there are different ways that we, we can arrange data on a computer. That's what a, that's what a data structure is. We have went through some scenarios of which data structure would you use. Um, but uh, it turns out that, that a dictionary is not some like fundamental uh, thing that uh, a computer system knows how to how to make. Um, we have to we have to construct it somehow. And a much simpler structure is a list, which is just like a block of these slots where we can put something in each slot. And so uh, in practice, that is what, we'll, what we will use behind, what Python will use behind the scenes to make uh, a dictionary work is, uh, it's actually a list and it's using this process to know, okay, which index of the list goes with which key. Here. So a dictionary is just a very, very fancy list. A dictionary is, is a fancy list where when we put something in it, we don't have to like search through all the spots in it to find where we put that thing. We have this uh, 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 technique that's going to tell us exactly where to look uh, without having to do any searching. So it, ha it can give us this sort of uh, efficient way of associating keys with values um, where we don't have to do the extra work of, of searching through a list. Other questions? All right, time to do the magic. This magic function is something called a hash function. And this is one of, one of the, the, these big ideas in computer science, this idea of, of hashing. And uh, a dictionary is also referred to as a hash table or a hash map because it's using this thing called a hash function. And a hash function is something that can take an object and turn it into a number. So might be easiest to see this just in practice. The exact details of how a hash function work, many different ways to design it, something that uh, you'll hear more about uh, in CS201. But a 
It's just, it is a built-in function in Python that we can call with any sort of value, and it's going to give us the number that comes when we, when we uh, hash that value. So if we uh, look at what is the hash value of 5, It is just five. So if we if we're looking for for the uh, the, the hash value for a number for an integer, just going to be uh, just going to be that integer. Uh, if we get the hash of two point one, that is this gigantic number. But remember. All we need is that this number is different for every key, and then we can use uh, our remainder to turn it into a valid index for our list. So we can look at some other ones. We can see, okay, what is the hash for Bilbo? What is the hash for Bilbo lowercase b? See, uppercase b, enormous positive number, lowercase b, enormous negative number. And uh, uh, the, the way these hash functions are designed is on purpose to, ma uh, to make it very likely that similar keys will have very different numbers come out. Because we want even small changes in the key to be as guaranteed as possible to give us a different number. Since if two keys give us the same number, then we're going to have a problem that our, our dictionary will think they both go to the same spot in our list. So sort of the, an intuition for how this hash function is working is that it's uh, a mathematical formula that is taking different parts of the value multiplying them by large numbers and adding that all up. So that a change in one part of the value causes the number that comes out to be pretty different. And so with this hash function, we can then get this nice dictionary-like behavior just using a list. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a, a, an incredibly powerful technique that is kind of used all over um, uh, uh, computer systems. Questions on on this idea of hashing? Cool. Is my hash different than your hash? Uh, you mean this this hash function or? I put that in my Python. Will I get a different number? Uh, Hopefully, uh, so in fact, we will get a different. We will get different numbers each time we we run, we run the program. Uh, so uh, this hash function is incorporating some information about maybe the time that the program was run or something else that's going to going to kind of be a source of of randomness or 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 difference. Uh, but it's uh, important that within the run of a single program, every time we get the hash for a particular value, it is the same. Otherwise, our, our dictionary uh, it just wouldn't work because we hash Bilbo the second time and it'd send us to some other place in our list. Uh, and, and that would be bad. Uh, but we can see here, same value for, for Bilbo, run it again. Different value than before, but the same within a, within a single program. So uh, there is this just one built-in hash function in Python, but it is incorporating uh, some kind of information that's changing each time the program is run. Gary. Um, for the negative numbers that come out of that, what does that mean? Do we use the like remainder mm -hmm. thing? Is it going to give us a negative? Yes. If so, how does that not end up like That's that's a good point. That this remainder better give us a positive 
always better give us a positive number. Otherwise, it's going to get screwy with where we put stuff uh, uh, in the list. So we can uh, test it with uh, these two, where we uh, look at what the hash is and look what it is mod 5. So those are two big positive numbers. We have positive, two big negative numbers, again, positive. So this, uh, this uh, remainder or modulo operator says uh, kind of where does this uh, number fall in this kind of world where we only have the numbers 0 to 4? Becca? What if you get the same Yes, so there are some things that I am not explaining here. Because if we only have five spots, what if we have more than five things in our dictionary and two end up to the same place? What if we just fill this up, period? What happens then? So there are some kind of other work we have to do to make our dictionary work for real. And for that, I'll point you to CS201, class entirely about data structures. Um, but yes, they, we, we do have to have some strategy for, there. it's called a collision, when two things go to the same index, and one strategy is like put it in the next open spot, um, and we do have to have some procedure for when our list fills up, then what do we do? Other questions? All right, that's the peek behind the, the, the curtain of dictionaries. So I'd like to do a bit of practice now. Nope, not with that one, though. Uh, so what if we had the following code? Uh, I have a string. How now? brown elephant seal. Uh, and I want to count how many times does each letter appear in this string. So think, for example, H appears twice, O appears three times, W three times, and so on. So I want, and I want to get a dictionary that has this like letter as the key and the number of times it shows up as the value. So I might create an empty dictionary that has character counts and then say for character in my string. And remember, when we write a for loop over a string, it will go letter by letter uh, through the string. And I say character counts of that plus equals one and then print out the character counts at the end. So I can tell you now, there is a bug in this code. And I would like you to discuss with your neighbors what that bug might be. All right, who has a, a suggestion for me? Uh, something I could, I could try to fix my, fix my key error. Maybe someone I, I haven't heard from yet today. John. Uh, well, before you do anything, you could do uh, if care not in care counts. Uh, which would that be before? In, loop, yeah. in, in the loop, you say? Yeah. So if my letter is not in my dictionary, yeah. And so then uh, if it's not already in it, you want to create like a new uh, key value for it. And then to add, or create, you can just create one and set it to one. Start. So I could. Uh, make the count associated with this character be B1. Um, if, if it's not in my dictionary, if I haven't seen it before, um, 
Is this a, a completed version? Everyone happy with this? Gabby? Um, if it's not in it, it's going through that conditional, but then it's doing it again, like, would you have to, like, put it into an else thing so that it only updates if, like, we only have that line six again if it's not a system? Yes, that we see H for the first time, we set its count to one, and then in, we would also do line six and set its count to, its count to two, but we've only seen it once. Uh, so one way to do this would be to put the updating <coughs> account in an else. So if, the, if we haven't seen this letter before, make its count be one. Otherwise, add one to whatever we have, however many we've counted so far. We run this, we see this dictionary printed out where key of H says there are two, key of O says there are three, W3, there are four spaces, so on and so forth. Come on. Couldn't you just have set it to zero and then it would have been okay without the else? Yes, and an alternate way would be if we haven't seen it before, make its count be zero and then once we do that, we're ready to be able to add one to its current value. So this would be this would be another way to to write the same the same code. Other questions? <coughs> All right. Enough of dictionaries for now. Let's talk about our next uh, big idea in CS. And let's imagine that, uh, uh, well, actually, could I get four volunteers to come up and stand in a line? Come on up. Anyone who wants to come stand in a line for some. <coughs> All right, stand in a line like here. Uh, maybe facing me like you're waiting in line to 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 um, uh, buy buy lunch, let's say. So uh, let's say Gabby's at the end of the line, uh, and let's assume that this line kind of stretches out of sight. Uh, Someone uh, suggest how Gabby might find out how many people are ahead in line. How would you find out how many how many people are? Yeah, Gabe. Yes. So. Gabby, you could ask for data. Hey, how many people are in front of you? Yeah. Oh, how many people are in front of you? Yeah. Um, I say how many there actually are. Well, so now, what are what are our options here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, yes. So, so here I think are 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 two 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 options. We have like uh, we could get out of line, uh, or have a friend get out of line and kind of walk along and count how many people are are in front, uh, or. You ask the person in front of you how many people are ahead of you. So uh, this first one, we might, if we were to, to do this sort of thing in, in Python, we might do it with a loop and describe it as an iterative solution. So you, you get out of line, <coughs> loop over however much line there is in front of you to, to count it up. 
is ask a person in front. Let's let's finish our, our simulation here. How many people are in front of you? Um, how many people are in front of you? I don't know how many people. Well, are so in front say of you. you're the front of the line. How many people are in front of you? None. I am the front. Yeah. So. None. Uh, one. Two. Yes. Exactly. So you ask the person in front of you, and then. And then we add one to whatever they say. And I guess our third option is we're at the front of the line, so zero. If we're at the front of the line, we know how many people are ahead of us. That's easy. Uh, so this ask the person in front of you. That was sort of a, a procedure, a function call, if you will. You ask the person in front of you how many people are ahead of you. And you do a little bit of work of adding one to whatever they say. But if we were to uh, simulate this approach in Python, we would have a function that's calling itself. That the function to find how many people are ahead of you involves asking the person in front of you to find how many people are ahead, of, are ahead of them, who then ask the person in front of them how many people, and so on. Thank you very much, volunteers. And this kind of approach is called recursive in, in computer science, that when we have a procedure, a function that's defined in terms of itself, that is called recursive. So if I were to uh, uh, start coding this up in Python, uh, a task that's sort of like uh, finding out how many people are in line uh, would be finding out how many things are in a list. Uh, let's say we don't have our, our handy len function. So we don't have a kind of built-in function to get the number of things in a list. So I want to define a list length function. It takes in a list that I'll call v. And if I were to kind of code up this step here, this approach here, I'd say, well, I know I'm in line. So the list there, there's at least one thing. And then I'll just ask the rest of the list to figure out how many things are in it, which in this case would be calling our function with the rest of the list after the first <coughs> element which I can get with a slice from index 1 to the end. So I basically count the first thing in the list and then say, someone else, a recursive call, tell me how many things are in the rest of the list. I'll add one to that, and that will be my total length. Oops. And then I can return return length. So we have a function that is calling itself, uh, but importantly, it's making a little bit of progress each time. Each time we're counting the first element, uh, and then we're calling our list length function with a slightly shorter list. Right? We slice from the, the second element, index 1, all the way to the end. So. Let's get some testing code up here, 245, and then print list length of x, which we, which we hope prints 3, because 3 is, is the correct length of that list. However, when I run this code, the program crashes with a, with a recursion error. Maximum recursion depth exceeded, which means 
the function called itself so many times that Python got sick of it and just said stop. That's, that's enough. So anyone have uh, a guess as to why? Well, actually, let's take a couple minutes, talk with your neighbors about uh, what might be like what might be wrong with this function and kind of what part of the like procedure we used with the, the people in line uh, does this function I've coded up not do? There's part of what we what we did in our, our little simulation up here that this function is is failing to do. So take a couple minutes and, and brainstorm with your neighbors. Uh, uh, thoughts, guesses about uh, what might be wrong with, with my, my list length function? What, what thing up here is, is this, this function not doing? Next. It's not giving it a, a way to get out of it because it keeps calling the list length before it can break out. Exactly. That we're, we're stuck in this step two. No matter what we're asking the person in front of us, the rest of the list, how many things there are. And at no point do we ever check, you know, are we, are we at the front of the line and we just see how many people are in front of us? Uh, it's as if the person in the front of the line just kept asking the air, how many people are in front of you? Well, I, wait, I, I want to know how many people, and they're just like yelling, yelling at the clouds. So this sort of uh, condition, if you will, where we no longer need to kind of make a recursive call, ask someone else to do the rest of the work, is called the base case, kind of the end of our recursion. The point at which we know what the answer for for should be. So, in the case of our our list, at what point do we know, without using our len function, how many things are in the list? Like, what might v what might v value might v have where we would know how many things are yeah Ava? Would the index maybe be none? There's no index there. That's on the, the right track. It's going to be a list that doesn't have any any indexes. Uh, I don't think we have a good way to, to check if an index is is none, uh, but yeah that we're on the right track, Jonathan. Uh, whenever uh, the like length you're on is the last one in the list, so you could index like negative one to the last thing to check when you're on the last index. So I'm not sure how we would know that it was the last one because we can see that we can check. Okay, there is something in the last, but if there isn't. I think that will give us an index error and crash our, our program. Finley? Is it when like, you ask for the next thing, you get an empty list? Yes. When v is an empty list, we know how many things, we know the length of that, it's zero. And so we can say if v is an empty list, the length of that is is zero. And if he isn't the empty list, then we can do our recursive call. We know there's at least one thing in there, and then we can ask the uh, have a recursive call, figure out how many things are in the rest of the list. This will work because this slice here, if there isn't anything at index one or after, that slice is going to give us an empty list. And so I'll, I'll add some print statements here to help us see what's, what's going on. So I'll print 
that we called uh, list length with our list v there. Here I'll say returning zero from base case. And here I'll say returning length from and then this call. <clears throat> so when I run my program, I see the first thing I see is called list length with my list two, four, five. Then the next thing I see is called list length with four, five. So we got to this recursive call, which called it on four, five. Then we called it with just on five, then called it with the empty. And only kind of once we get all the way down to our base case, do we start returning from our recursive calls. And so we see returning zero from the base case. So it returns zero here. And then our length is one. So we add one to that and we return one from our call uh, that was just on the list of five. That returns one to the previous call list, list length. Uh, and we add one to that. And so we return two from, the, from our call on the list four or five and then return three from our call on the full list. And then we print out three down here. One nice way to think about this is these recursive calls are kind of like a stack of plates that our first call of two, four, five, and then the next call we make kind of gets stacked on top of our first call. So then that's calling with the rest of our list. And then our next call after that gets stacked on top. And then we have our call with the, the empty list. That hits our base case. And so when we return from one of these calls, that's like we're removing the plate off of our stack. So this returns zero, which gets returned back to the next plate in our stack, which does zero plus one. So it returns one back to uh, the next plate. That adds one to the return value. So it returns two back to our, our bottom plate, which adds one to it. And it returns three as our, our final result. So kind of the way that these recursive calls are, are happening every time we make one, we're sort of putting more plates on the stack. And then once we hit our base case, they start returning and we're removing plates from the stack. So this kind of idea of a recursive function, it's one of these kind of big ideas in, in computer science. Um, and it's a very tricky one. Definitely will take some, some getting used to. So, Please ask me some questions about this. So, uh, so well, you know, I'm having trouble understanding is like since a function ends at return, why is it that once it hits return zero, it's kind of continuing on? That, that's an excellent question. We, we think of return as ending the function. Uh, and I make a slight adjustment to, to that. That return ends the current function call. So each of the plates in this stack represent one of our calls to list length. And so when we hit return in one of them, 
it returns, it ends that function call, that call to list length, and goes back to the previous one where it was called. So it's like we had four different functions, A called function B, called function C, called function D. It's just in this case, they all happen to be the same function. Other questions? All right, let's do a bit of practice. Here I have Marco. I didn't see my. Um, I didn't see. What do you call this thing? Uh, oh, the cards. Maybe maybe someone grabbed yours by mistake. You can just grab grab any number if you can't find yours there. If anyone has number three? It's mine. <laughs> But uh, consider this, this recursive function uh, and uh, think about what, what is it going to print. All right, please discuss with your, your neighbors how you thought about kind of thinking through what this function would do. I uh, indeed wrote a, wrote a function that uh, prints out uh, the countdown in, a, uh, in the expected order, three, two, one, blast off. Uh, any questions about uh, why it prints it out in, in that order as opposed to uh, one of these different ones or any part of this code would be helpful to go over? David. Could you kind of explain this code in like the same way they explained it with addition, like the desk? Yes. So if we were to kind of draw our 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 plate diagram for this. Uh, what what is our first call? Countdown with what what number? Yeah, three. So we uh, the first thing is our countdown of of three. Uh, n equals equals zero, that's false. Then we get to print n. So kind of at this point, before any other plates are involved, uh, we have uh, printed, uh, uh, printed three. Then we do our countdown of n minus one. So that's our plate with two, check in, if n equals zero, it doesn't. We get to print n. That prints two. So our, our output so far has been three and then two. Then we call countdown again of n minus one. We get one. That prints out one. That calls countdown of zero. And does equal zero, we print blast off, then our n equals zero uh, returns. And we can see that after we make our recursive call, count n of n minus one, the function doesn't do anything else. So when we return to the call of count n one, it doesn't have anything left to do, it returns. Count n of two doesn't have anything left to do, it returns. Count n of three returns. And so, if I flipped the order of a couple lines where I printed after I made the recursive call, then I would make the recursive call to three, then two, then one, then zero, which would print blast off, return to one, which would then print one, return to two, which would then print two. Uh, so if I, I did it in this way, I'd get blast off, one, two, three. Does that make sense? Other questions? Okay. Not that you would want to do this, but just so, like I can understand it better. Like for the like option B, where it's like one two three, uh, or three two one blast off. Then one two three, how would you print that? Oh, my like to make it be like, the first thing. 
Uh, so I think you would do it. Oops. By printing before and after uh, countdown, so we'd get down to zero. We'd print blast off. We already printed three, two, one. Then we'd return to one. It would print one again. Um, and so with with them like this, we'd get that kind of symmetrical pattern. All right, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, we'll talk all, uh, spend uh, all our next class talking about recursion as well. Get started on the Enigma Machine Lab, and I'll see you Friday or in office hours in 10 minutes. Thank <laughs> you.